All right, welcome back to the Humans of Grappling podcast. After a hiatus, uh, I am back in full content creator mode uh, in multiple mediums and formats, uh, just trying to make something work. <laughs> this is kind of the thing that uh, I've come to terms with, is that I'm not totally sure what my niche is yet, uh, but doing more is going to help me figure things out better than waiting and doing less and thinking through things. I'm kind of just iterating. I'm just kind of moving in a direction and taking steps, concrete steps towards something. Uh, and hopefully that leads me to actually figure out what I'm trying to do here. So uh, I wrote, well, starting to post some articles about 10 things that I wish I knew 10 years ago when first starting my career. So this episode is going to be episode one of uh, that list. <laughs> Hopefully there will be 10 episodes, each corresponding to eat. Like I've posted the, the article on Instagram and maybe I'll post it somewhere else. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I've been at work uh, at my employer for 10 years and I feel like I've, I know a thing or two. I can confidently say that I may know some things and it could be helpful to people like me um, 10 years ago, people in their early 20s trying to figure things out. Spoiler alert, I'm still trying to figure things out, but from a little bit ahead of you, right? Like it's not, you, you never figure everything out, but I have kind of the basics down. So the first thing that I wish I knew, uh, the topic of this episode is work is going to be hard, but not necessarily in the way you expect it. Um, so if you read the article, I'll probably read some of it and kind of spin off from there. But uh, college was hard. Like there, there's no doubt about that. Like the, it was one of the most yeah formative periods of my life. Um, I knew it was hard going into it. And that's kind of like the whole idea of getting into a good school is good means it's hard. <laughs> like they, they don't tell you that at 18 of like, Oh yeah, you should test into a, a good school and apply to a good school and try to whatever, go to Harvard, MIT, whatever. Good, good means hard. Like they are going to push you They're They are there to get the best out of you. Um, so college is hard because it's in a compressed timeline. Like you're trying to get all these different experiences and, uh, classes and all this stuff in this like four to five year timeline. And you're, you're still a young adult. Like you're still like your frontal lobe is not fully developed. So hopefully you had good parents who helped guide you hopefully away from indebting yourself to the tune of a couple hundred thousand to start. Um, like my, my parents did, like they kind of guided me away from like private school. Cause I was looking into, um, division three football, which is, I don't know. Very much glad I did not do that. <laughs> uh, because that would, that would put me in a very different financial position. Um, than I am in today. Cause like division three doesn't offer scholarships. Like that's the, the, the crappy thing about it. Um, so I ended up going to Cal Poly, which is, a, which was a fucking steal, uh, compared to what it is now is <laughs> like, um, it is one of the premier learn by doing, uh, colleges. So, uh, we ran the quarter, the quarter system. Uh, I know a lot of schools are semester based and whatnot, but Cal Poly quarters were just like kind of an excuse to shrink, uh, courses into 10 weeks instead of whatever the normal semester is, 15 weeks, 20, I, I have no idea how long a semester is. So these 10 week 
semesters is just like 10 weeks plus like finals week or something like that. Um, so it was like really something like, yeah, 11 or 12 weeks, um, because there might be a, a break or something like that in there too. Um, they were just hard. It was just a sprint. There was just class after class of, um, just work like you you just it was a never-ending cycle of as soon as you so like my my so in engineering school we had labs we you would there's like three things to do for a lab a lab class and the lab class was only worth one credit <laughs> it was compared to like your normal lecture is like three or something like that or three or four i forget what forget exactly how much what it counted as but the lab ended up being like way more work than it was actually like weighted on our gpa right so like we do the pre-lab so the pre-lab assignment is like gets you ready you do whatever equations you figure stuff out before you get into the lab before you get into Say if it was a chemistry lab, you're like, okay, I need to mix these chemicals together in some way or whatever and make it this expected way or for more for like what I did was like electrical engineering. Okay, we have to wire these circuits in a certain way and we should expect certain voltages here and here and by using this resistor and whatnot, this transistor, that we should expect certain things to happen throughout the circuit. Um, so the, like you do the lab. The lab is three hours long, or the lab period is three hours long. Usually you get done in like hour and a half or something like that, two hours, but um, it, it's a three-hour block in your schedule. And then you do the post-lab, <laughs> and then you you go and you have to light up, write up the lab report, um, Usually with, like, you're in a lab group because, like, it's not a... We don't have enough resources to do everything together. So you'd have, like, normal, like, lab partners that you collaborate with. Um, and you would have to probably meet up with them to do the lab report with them. But actually, this was actually around the time that Google Docs was initially introduced um and that was magical like in my it must be must have been like my junior or senior year where my my uh, lab buddies were like oh hey let's just write up the lab docs and google docs and we don't have to like meet <laughs> cuz that that's that was like a, a whole ordeal in itself of like having to like schedule time with your lab partners to talk about what 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 happened in the lab and how to answer certain questions and I don't know. It was, it was a lot of work for, I don't know, the, the, the doing the labs was fun. Like I, I, I liked wiring up stuff. I liked seeing how things worked and whatnot, but all the, the paperwork around it just felt like, I don't know, too much maybe, but like, that's, that, that's kind of like the, the purpose of the school is to weed out people who think that is too much and they're not willing to go through the shit in order to get out to the other side and to earn the degree and whatnot. So yeah, like the fir first, the first day of engineering school, uh, they were like, Hey, look to your left, look to your right. Um, one of you, what the person you're left, the person you're right. One of you is not going to graduate. Like the, there's usually a 30% dropout rate or something like that among engineering students. I don't know who was to the left or right of me, but I made it. So who knows uh, how many people actually finished. But um, if you could get through four or five years of engineering, there was a basically a job guaranteed on the other side. And that was very motivating to me was that there was a well-paying career after this. I knew that I could make something of like make good money on the other side of the schooling. So that's what got me through all of the different labs and the, uh, uh, the bullshit work, the paperwork, all that. So then like describing 
all that college work. That's that is the hardest thing I've ever done up until that point. But now here comes like actual in work in the industry. Uh, in the industry is like a whatever college term because the professors they the professors work in academia. Everyone else works in works in industry. So. Uh, once you get into the industry, it's a much longer game. It's not a, you're not just white knuckling for four or five years. Uh, you're, <laughs> you have to figure out a, a better pace for the next, you know, 40 years. If you're planning, on planning, if you're like 22 and you want to retire by 60 something, that's 40 years. So, and, and that's if, you know the retirement age continues to be 65 and who knows people talk about raising the retirement age and that's a whole nother can of worms. But so you, you graduate your fancy engineering school thinking you're something and you kind of are like you, you made it through something hard. You, you deserve to, you deserve to, you know, like feel good about that. Feel good about, uh, making it through white knuckling four or five years. But you get hired, maybe you do an internship prior to that, and you don't really get the sense of this when you're an intern, but be, because like they make internships fun and it's only for a quarter, basically. It's for 10 weeks over the summertime, so they're just trying to recruit you to come back and, and work for that company. And so so you're, yeah, you're, you're basically in college and you're making some money. It is more of an intern vibe but once you get out of school you graduate you go full time that that's it <laughs> like that there's no uh i don't know you you it's not just summertime that you experience in the office you you also have to you, you go through fall you go through winter and what what's was interesting about going through my first year as full time I'm like, oh, I I understand why they like us to intern during the summer times. Is because it's fu- it's like it's light out. Like you you go outside after work and it's still light out. You still feel like you have time to do stuff, run errands, or go whatever, meet up with your friends or whatever. Like you you ha- you can go do something fun after work. You you feel like you still have a life after work, but in the winter time, the dead of winter. It gets dark at four or five, like fall. Man, yeah, get, get start starts getting dark at like whatever five or whatever. I don't know. Dusky at four, and then for sure like pitch black at five, which is crazy. But I kind of knew this already. I just didn't, didn't really. Maybe I wasn't in, as attuned to the seasons as I was very well aware of like, oh, I have to be in this office until five and I look out the window and it's fucking dark out. Like, oh, this is kind of depressing. I <laughs> I get to the office when it's still light out and then I leave the building when it's dark out. So that I don't know. That that's kind of the the realization that there's real seasons out there and you have to live through those real seasons as a real professional. And I kind of knew like winter was dark uh, from, I, I had the same kind of feeling from high school wrestling is that we would, uh, school would get out at three, three Oh three or something like that. And then wrestling practice would start at three thirty, So we would, uh, horse around with our friends a little bit and then have to get to practice afterwards. So we'd get in the room, it's still light out outside, and then there was just this little, like, if you haven't been in, well, I don't know, at least our wrestling mat room, it was all mats, and the the only window was on the door, it was just this tiny little square, and you could still, you could look at the square and see that, oh, hey, the, it's, it's light out outside, or whatever, um, but by the time practice ended, which was like, I don't know, hour and a half later, probably around like five, 
it was pitch black. It was dark. And it made it feel so much later than, because, uh, yeah, we were, like, dying in wrestling, doing a ton of a ton of work for an hour and a half or something like that. I have, I have no idea how long practices were now. And then I go home, shower, eat something. And I got into this habit, which is, like, to this day is my... My routine is I, I like going to sleep early and I like waking up early. And that kind of reinforced it for me as I was just like, I'm too tired to actually do my calculus homework or whatever, or to focus on whatever essay, ne- essay I needed to write. Okay, I'll just go to bed early and I'll just wake up early and just do all my homework in the before school starts. And that was my, that was That was just how I did things and worked out okay for me. So there's a, yeah, a certain amount of like figuring out how you work involved in how you become a professional is like, you, you just have to know you, nobody sits down and is perfectly productive for eight hours every day. 360, whatever, however many working days there are in a year, five days a week, 50 weeks a year, nobody is cranking out, typing things or doing, doing something eight hours a day for eight hours a day straight. There's no way. I prefer the maker manager approach. Alex Ramosi most recently like talked about this, but he got it from like Paul Graham, I believe. And these are two different types of schedules where you have, you just need large blocks of time if you're a maker, if you're a creator, like software developer, programmer. And if anybody schedules a meeting in the middle of that, it just kind of ruins it, right? Like, it's just kind of like, ah, fuck, I need to, I don't know. I'm worried about this meeting or I'm like, I don't want to do anything before the meeting and the context switch and Like you to get into this deep work flow, it just takes a lot of effort. And if you don't feel like you're going to be in it for a long time, why even do it? Why even try to put forth the effort? So what's interesting with junior developers when they start, or at least I can speak to what I felt like when I first started was I just wanted to be in all the meetings. I wanted to feel important. I wanted to feel important. I actually wasn't important and I had this like chip on my shoulder and I felt like oh they're they're passing me up or whatever and you I don't know like oh I know all this stuff like why like there was a a manager opening like a year and a half in while I or maybe maybe I was two years into the job and uh, a manager role opened up for basically managing the team I was I was on in DevOps and they didn't ask, nobody asked me to be a manager. They asked some other guy to be a manager. Uh, he was a very good manager for me. But I, at the time, when he first, when I heard that they were uh, first picking him, I was like, ah, oh, what the hell? Like, I know how to do all these things and DevOpsy things. Like, he doesn't, he's not as in tune with the DevOps or whatever. Well, that's the point, is that managers, they go and sit in all the meetings just so the makers, the developers, the coders, whoever, the people actually doing the work don't have to go into meetings and ruin their whole fucking day and not be able to do anything productive outside of meetings. So it's sort of like looking back on it now, and this should be like more well advertised, is that managers are productive via meetings. And if you like meetings for whatever reason, if that is the thing you enjoy doing and coding isn't totally for you actually hands-on keyboard coding is isn't for whatever reason you don't enjoy learning new stuff or you or may not learn new stuff but you don't enjoy you don't get the same dopamine hit as as i do as making something that i've been working on for a long time work and just like bashing my head against the keyboard and going through a hundred iterations of whatever, whatever the, 
the issue is I always like it's the best feeling to solve that problem and see everything work. I'm just like, I just get this little like, fuck yes. Like it's, if I did not have that, I would have quit a long time ago. I would have quit in high school. Like <laughs> honestly, like I, I took my first programming class in high school and if I didn't feel that sense of accomplishment, then it's not for you. Like it wouldn't have been for me. And I wouldn't encourage anybody to, to do programming um, if they didn't feel some sense of like accomplishment or some sense of, uh, I don't know, feeling good about themselves for solving a hard problem. If they just, if they're just like, ah, fuck, that was a hard problem and you don't feel anything about it, like, the feedback loop is is not churning there. Like, you're, you're not uh, the flywheel of encouraging you to do this thing over and over and over again. That's not going to churn, and you're not going to enjoy your career. And you're just going to white-knuckle it, and it's not going to be good. So, so yeah, find some... So, for those of you who, who have waited patiently for jujitsu <laughs> to be mentioned here, uh, this is like jujitsu. It's like you... Your first day of jujitsu, do you really like it or are you completely grossed out by it, right? Like, is it something that you you get choked out 10 times the first day? And is that the thing you like to do? Or are you, like, appalled at how sweaty and gross the mats are and you never want to do that again? Like, there, there's just, it's a binary. It's It's like... You really like it or you don't. And that's okay. If if you don't, you you can go play other sports and there's other things to do with your life besides jujitsu. Probably better things to do, honestly, with your life besides jujitsu. Um but I'm twelve years in and uh I'm kinda <laughs> I'm kinda in too deep. Just kidding. So yeah, you you have to feel something in whatever the, the thing is that you're doing. And you have to have that. It's a sense of like internal motivation. It's your internal motivation, internal validation. Like you can feel like yourself, you can feel yourself getting better. Uh, and you, you're intr intrinsically that that's the word I was looking for. Intrinsically motivated. We're recording this at nine fifteen at night. So my brain is a little tired. Uh, I haven't, like, I, I trained this morning at 6 a.m., so I need to go to bed soon, so excuse me if I'm uh, trailing off a little bit more than usual. So intrinsic motivation, um, that's really important for junior developers ex especially because there will be no extrinsic motivation for a long time, uh, at least a year. You don't get a good, you don't get an A on your report card on the, on the quarter or whatever, right? Like every, every quarter you can get a GPA and you get your cumulative GPA. Like you get when you're, so as you develop throughout your whole life, you get these little feedback checkpoints and whatnot. And when you're uh, a little kid, like for jujitsu little kids, they get a stripe every week or something. I don't know. I, like it's pretty frequently that they get a stripe and they have 20 stripes on their belt. Um, and that's just, you know, like you got to give little kids something. They, they're more ex they're more extra extrinsically motivated. They're motivated by stuff outside of them. But as you get older, you grow up, you get homework assignments and tests. And like, there are certain, like certain tests that are, worth more and but th there's only like three of them throughout the whole year or throughout the quarter or throughout the class or whatever you gotta nail them you don't you can't just sl skate by on like just doing the homework like you you actually have to know the material and actually pass the pass those tests um so that's a little bit less f frequent feedback right of like how how well you're doing. So once you get out of college, your feedback loop is once a year officially, right? Like you don't, your, your comp, your, your, the, the real feedback loop of like, am I getting a raise or am I 
getting stock units or whatever, right? You don't know that until like April every year, at least for my company. In between that, yeah, you have to talk to your manager and get a, a sense of how you're doing. And they'll tell it like, hopefully they tell you like straight up, Hey, you're fucking up here. You should be doing X, Y, and Z. I didn't like how you handled that situation. Hopefully they give you negative feedback along the way and not just, and not sugarcoated negative feedback. That wasn't it. That was an issue I ran into is that I didn't, I didn't understand when I was in trouble. Everything was framed in a like positive way. It was like, Hey, you could be doing this better. To me, as a dumb college student, I was like, oh, okay, that's an improvement. That like I view that as a positive thing. And managers are trained to frame things, frame negative things as positive things, to like soften the blow. But don't understand things unless my wife knows this too all too well. Unless you yell it at me. <laughs> unless you you like explicitly tell me, uh, hey, like you're fucking up. Hey, you need to really do this thing now. Like in un, no uncertain terms, you need to tell me this is what I need to do. And that is not the way in corporate corporate, at least certain parts of corporate speak um, is not direct. It's very indirect. So there, there should be like a whole class on like how to read in between the lines of like how, like what, uh, like how to read emails that are uh, trying to get you to do something or whatever, right? I don't know. Or, or how to get, how to get real feedback from your manager, a real actual feedback, not just, oh yeah, you're doing great, whatever, just keep doing what you're doing. I've gotten tons of those, but if you only get those, if you only get positive feedbacks and then they kind of like drop the bomb on you in your annual review oh, yeah, you didn't get the promotion, oh, it was tight this year, like, compensation was tight, budget was tight, sorry, we couldn't get you the promo. Like, th there's there's a much longer and a much harder feedback loop, a much higher bar to achieve to get that uh, next level. Whereas college is graded every, you know what your grade is for four classes in every 10 weeks, you, you know how good you're doing and you get kind of rewarded with that, right? More or less four times as long <laughs> in, in industry. It's, it's four of those. It's a, an entire year that isn't really demarcated too well. Like you don't really know it's more demarcated by month than anything. Um, cause things are like, Oh, this, we need this by the end of the month or need this by the end of the quarter and the end of the quarter is the, the end of next month or whatever. Right. So, so really it's like 12 mini quarters. If you even want to think of it like that, it's or 12 sets of four weeks. Right. So the, the feedback cycle is much longer and it's, it's very hard for junior developers to understand the, that their, their hard work, they may be like that, but their hard work isn't going to be immediately rewarded. Like there isn't, uh, it, it's delayed gratification. It's, it's not immediate. Like, you, like, yeah, you get, you get an attaboy or whatever for, Oh yeah, cool. Sweet. That works. And you get to present it and kind of get recognition from the team maybe, but the, the real feedback, the, the real like dollars and cents feedback doesn't happen <laughs> until like, six months from that or eight months from that. All right. Like it, you have to be able to capture that moment and then replay it a, almost a year from now, uh, to your manager and their manager and say, Hey, I think I deserve a promotion because I did X, Y, and Z. Remember back when I did that thing, it was so cool. And the first time around you as a junior developer, the thing that you did probably wasn't so cool. Like it was just some basic thing and it was just some toy project to like get you up to speed on whatever the, the rest of the team is doing. And that's okay. Like it's the, the expectations are super low 
as a junior developer. Even though you want to be, you want to climb the ladder, you want to advance, you want to like go up and up and up and do well and whatnot. Chill, like chill where there's low expectations, like enjoy the process. Take that time to, to develop because you're you're not going to be able to like sprint your way there. That you can't you're you're not going to go from say like junior dev to like mid-level dev in 10 weeks. There's no way. Like nothing is nothing that you can accomplish in 10 weeks is going to take you from junior dev to to mid-level dev or junior dev to senior dev. Like it has to be a consistent output over time that can be measured in two, three, four major projects that you can say you can put your name on and be like, I delivered that. So yeah, just hang out. Like don't, um, don't try to race the finish line because it's the finish line is very far off. So the, so to compare and contrast junior devs and senior devs, junior devs may work more. All right. So junior devs, um, have start with no experience, lower skill level, and all they have is time and effort. Senior dev, senior devs, on the other hand, they have a ton of skills, ton of experience, and they can leverage those into not putting as much time in. Junior devs need to, and they can diversify their interests, like have a family <laughs> or, uh, I don't know, have hobbies outside of work and whatnot. Like <clears throat> those skills become highly levered and their specialty, they're paid more for their knowledge and their ability to solve problems rather than just punching a clock, sitting at butt in a seat eight hours a day or whatever. It, it's more like what is the value of the projects that you get done? Ask me how I know <laughs> of, about the senior engineer secrets is that, yeah, like I know kind of Jenkins in and out like the back of my hand. And it's a technology that I've used for eight of my 10 years as a professional, or even probably more than that, like nine of my 10 years as a uh, software developer. So if it's something Jenkins related, I've seen all of the issues. <laughs> like there's, there's nothing that there, there's some, there's rarely anything that surprises me anymore. <clears throat> and because of that, like, I don't have to do a ton of like researching or debugging. I just kind of like be like, all right, looks like this. And my pattern matching brain recognizes, okay, I, <clears throat> I think I've seen this before. And I did X, Y, and Z to fix it. Okay, let's try that out. Oh, cool, it worked. It, or it works on the first try or whatever. Right? Like, I, I know pathways of how certain problems tend to go. Versus a, a junior developer, they haven't seen all these things before. So they may take the, a problem that, say, I could finish, that I could like fix in five minutes. It might take them five days to figure out what's going on. And maybe they, they get like closer and closer and closer every day and they need to ask for help and I need to point them in the right direction and whatnot. But there's certain things that are like highly like insane leverage in terms of skill and knowledge that only comes with time and experience. Like you can't shortcut the process. You can't uh, be Neo in the Matrix and just download Jujitsu into your brain and just sh just shortcut white to black belt. You can't. Like the, there, you have to go through this like the process of doing it. And this is like a very ecological thing where you're you actually have to do the thing itself, right? As a as this, and you you attune to your environment. You you interact like so ecological approach, ecological dynamics. The basic concept is that we are organisms. the 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 organism is itself, and everything else, everything outside of the organism, is the environment. 
So you only learn how to do things by interacting with your environment. You can only perceive things by interacting with your environment. Even if it, like it's your eyes looking at something, you're still interacting with the environment because that's those photons are hitting your eyeballs in a certain way and like you're you're attuning your your eye muscles are attuning to the light in a certain way like whatever like you're trying to read you learn how to read right like you're that's an interaction with the environment you're the, these these letters mean something you you have to learn how to how to decode these these messages over time right um so i i i view everything like since learning hearing about it from greg souders like a uh, year and a half ago damn near two years ago maybe um it's changed my entire perspective on how we learn like it, it's the, it's the shim this like fundamental layer of how we learn and if we know how to interact with that i feel like th this should just be taught in schools and like th this would solve all of our problems if we just knew how to interact and if we learned how to learn if this this fundamental skill was taught in class of like all right <laughs> so we're just gonna do the thing we're just gonna you want to learn about whatever all right go and do whatever uh, and you'll get a lot closer to it than just reading books about, about whatever rather than doing whatever. So like, think about how good at jujitsu would you be if all you did was read jujitsu, read about jujitsu, watch instructionals, and you never rolled, you never, <clears throat> you never live sparred, you never met any resisting opponent. Versus somebody who only trained in live sparring. Maybe never watched an instructional. No, has never heard of who Gordon Ryan is. Or John Danaher or whoever. They just know jiu-jitsu is a thing. They just roll with their buddies. And they get better. Who would win? Who would win in a competition? The person who's only done the live training. So... <clears throat> Uh, Greg Souders uses that as, as an example to to point to what is the more important activity that we should be doing. What should we be focused on? Probably live training most of the time, if not all of the time. So the, the main thing then is doing the thing over a long enough period of time such that you don't burn out. Uh, junior developers, they get overly ambitious. They're like, I'm going to change the company. I'm going to save the company in a quarter. I'm going to do a ton of work and I, I will be recognized and whatever un, unmet needs <laughs> are in my personal life will be met somehow by, by my work family or whatever, right? Uh, and then, of course, that doesn't happen. And the junior developer burns out by month six and it's like oh man how do you guys keep up with this pace this pace of innovation or whatever and the senior dev devs are like what <laughs> like what are you talking about like we're just here showing up doing our thing and this is just what we do like it's just a a daily thing it's just part of their schedule. It's just who they are, a part of who they are and what they do. And it's less of a effort as it is a habit at that point, right? Like it's just you, you wake up, you go to work, you do, you, you go to your meetings in the morning, have a lunch with your colleagues, you go to uh, come back, you do some work in, in the afternoon, you sign off. You, you go home, you run errands, you do something hopefully you enjoy, you have enough time to do that. Um, and then you repeat the process. Five days a week, two days off. Every week for 40 years straight. Maybe you have some vacations in there. Like, that's it. So, what, again, like junior developers, all they have is time and effort. Senior developers is kind of on the other spectrum. Th think, if you haven't gotten it already, think junior developers as white belts senior developers as like upper belts purple brown black belts what do white belts have they only have 
energy. <laughs> like, they have no skill. They they don't know what they're doing. And all they can do is flail around and try to do something useful, right? Whereas the upper belts have some, some idea of what they're doing. They have certain things that they, they're actively wanting to work on. And they're much more efficient, energy efficient. They, they don't need to spaz out to take somebody down to pass their guard like it's it's actually rare that they like breathe hard and like get their heart rate pumping because they they they're just so far ahead of most of the class in terms of technique like they it it's not a they're, they're they have to handicap themselves to get a challenge to like work on something specific in their game rather than just working on their A game the whole time. So how do junior developers become senior developers? Through through enough time and enough effort. But the the intensity that I guess that's the the third the third uh parameter there is much should be much less than what you expect. And that's that's kind of the whole time that's the reason behind this whole title of this article is that work is going to be hard, but not necessarily in the way you expect it. You can't sprint your way to senior developer. You can't sprint your way to black belt. Of course, you hear all the stories about BJ Penn getting his black belt in four years or five years or whatever. And like you get all these, like this lore taught, taught to you as a white belt. And just throw that shit out. Like, you are not the exception. E- even though, like, that that's what keeps you around. Like, you're like, oh, what if I can be good? Or this, whatever, the next big thing in jujitsu or whatever. You're not. <laughs> like, you're just an average guy. And that's fine. Like, we, we need a bunch of average guys who just want to come in and work hard. And, like, yeah, maybe you can make something of yourself. Like, I feel like I've done a decent amount in jujitsu and I'm just an average guy who's worked hard. Like I'm, I've zero, I don't know. I guess my, my talent is being strong. I guess my talent is in being strong and having good cardio. Um, of just having natural, like my dad was a runner and I'm sure people prior to, uh, I don't know, upwards in my family tree. We somehow had good lungs, good cardiovascular system. Um, and the, my mom's side, the Polish side, probably where I get my ability to lift things from. And just looking at a weight, like just whatever. I get stronger just looking at a weight. And I just, I, I just already feel the, the, <laughs> the, the anabolic surge in me or whatever, right? So I guess that the, those are my talents. The, those are the things I came with. I'm, I was naturally the strongest guy, one of the strongest guys. On, on like my high school football team. So I, yes, I came in with talent, but a lot of people don't come in with talent and they develop their skills in any way. It's just, you're, it's just, that's just a factor in getting you to where you want to be. Right. And that, that's just the shows just kind of is a trajectory that you can kind of other people can kind of map out. Like it, when you're a white belt and when you're in it, you're like, Oh fuck, I'm just, you're spazzing, you're just trying to figure out how to survive and how to win white belt matches, <laughs> like a white belt, white belt, like bet matches. Like I, I'm, I'm just uh, laughing because there's this meme of like two, like, I think it's like lobsters <laughs> and a bunch of people like yelling and the, these, whatever, at these two lobsters that are like going to fight or something. And it's just the perfect, like, like white belt versus white belt, like, f- like challenge fight. And uh, everyone circling around him are, are the upper belts, like, <laughs> just like <laughs> taking side bets and, and whatnot. It's just, it's just hilarious because it, it's so, it's just, just so true. So anyways, where was I going with that in terms of work? Oh, intensity over time. So yeah, you have to really dial back the intensity of college was intense. That that's what you needed in college. Work is not as intense. You just need it's just longer. So like the the intensity like over whatever say uh, ten weeks like yeah it's pretty intense. You got to work a lot of hours and 
get all that shit done. But for but for regular work, now that you're in the, in the industry, that that ten week project that's that's like a quarter, right? Well, may, maybe that that's more over six months because you can't just throw it away when you're done with it. Like you can't just turn it in for an A, get it, <clears throat> and just never touch it again, right? There, there's there's way more uh, considerations when you write code in a team environment, uh, enterprise setting that this code has to work with a lot of different things with a lot of pre-existing systems and has to be approved by all kinds of different people. There's just a lot more process around writing code and that just keeps everything safe and moving and uh, not sending bugs out to customers. So now I've been kind of ragging on the the negatives of being an industry or the negative differences of being an industry, but the positives are you get paid <laughs> you for, for versus college you get you get paid versus you paying for the privilege to work right you're getting paid for the privilege of working and learning uh you're improving your skills on the job like you're you're growing you're meeting connections um uh, people who could be your teammates now or in the future, you get your weekends back. You, like, can go and do stuff. It's not engineering school anymore where, yeah, you go out Friday, Saturday night, but then you got to spend all day Sunday in the library working on all the homework that was hanging over your head for those two days that you just kind of abdicated responsibility, right? Like it, there's a, there's a certain level of freedom of like knowing that work is contained within these certain hours outside of those hours, nobody's expecting you to, to respond or for you to, to actually work on stuff. Um, everybody, everybody just kind of respects our right, nine to five, nine to five are these normal working hours that we all agree to. And Saturday, Sunday, we don't expect anybody to work or if they do, we pay them extra. Right. So, yeah, you can actually do stuff on the weekends and like enjoy it and not have to worry about the, the project or the report or whatever that you have to do when you come back home. So in, in summary, being a professional is a long game, but it's what's given me a lifestyle that allows me to be very fulfilled on and off the job. Just don't get too ahead of yourself. Starting out, though, you're still a rookie. Tune in next time for part two. You start at the bottom at the totem pole again.